I'm delighted to welcome Lloyd, who will be speaking on the Clark Task Force, which is uh, something that he thinks deserves more wider appreciation than has been given to Lloyd. Thank you very much. President, as with everybody else, I'm uh, experimenting a bit with this. So far, okay or not okay? Okay. Thank okay, you. okay. Thank you. The areas covered yellow on that map make up an independent nation called Papua New Guinea. We see there in yellow a portion of the land mass known as New Guinea, plus a scattered collection of islands also in yellow. The nation of Papua New Guinea. The largest of the individual islands is called New Britain. We see New Britain at the edge of the map to our right as we view the full map. We go closer to New Britain next. Today's story is centred on that island and in particular on the town of Rabaul, seen at our extreme right. It is said that when presenting an address with history as the theme, a good way to lose the attention of an audience is to overload the address with dates. We will try to dodge that problem here today, but we need some dates upon which to mount the story. So our first date is 25 April 1941, Anzac Day. The passenger vessel Zealandia is tying up at the wharf at Rabaul on the island of New Britain in Papua New Guinea and that's 81 years ago next week isn't it? The contingent of Australian soldiers is ready to go ashore. A similar contingent a similar contingent had arrived four weeks earlier aboard the liner Katoomba. The total of the two contingents was 1,000. The official military name was Lark Force, L-A-R-K. It was not just Anzac Day back in Australia, because Anzac Day was recognised also at Rabaul because Papua New Guinea was under Australian administration. And of course that meant a holiday at Rebel, didn't it? As an item of purely selfish interest, might I say that on the previous day back in Australia, at age nine, I lined up with my grade four and the other grades in the yard at the Redan State School at Ballarat around the flagpole. The headmaster announced school attention, boys the flag salute. Then followed, as always, an address by a veteran from the First World War wearing whatever parts of his old uniform that he still has perhaps a bit tight around the good. Medals and ribbons, medals and ribbons had been carefully pinned on before he left home. There was always reference in an Anzac Day address to Gallipoli and much use of words like mates and bravery and loyalty. <coughs> After that, back to class. Today, ceremonial conduct for children <clears throat> and a bit of national pride is not encouraged but it seemed to do us no harm did it? When Lark Force arrived at Rabaul 
Australia had been involved for 16 months in the Middle East desert campaign of World War II, but the Pacific War against Japan had not yet commenced. The Lark Force contingent to Rabaul was not sent as a fighting force. It was a garrison contingent. Next. Lark Force became a fighting force almost eight months later when Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japan on what President Roosevelt called a day of infamy. That was 8 December 1941. Why then did the contingent of Australian soldiers originally go to Rabaul when there was no war in the area? They went because Rabaul was an administrative centre for the Australian management of the mandated territory known as Papua New Guinea. The Australian government held a mandate from the League of Nations. That mandate came into force immediately following the First World War. Prior to that, Germany held the mandate. <coughs> World War I changed that situation. As mentioned, Lark Force at Rabaul was a garrison contingent. The role was to support the Australian administration and to carry out a watching brief in a situation that was becoming volatile under the threat of Japan's known ambitions in the Pacific. Next. I should have arranged a glass of water. Thank you. <coughs> As a contingent, Lark Force came out of the second the wrong, the second twenty-second battalion AIF. The second twenty-second battalion AIF. Most members were from Victoria. The Lark Force marching band was in the main made up of Salvation Army personnel. Seven of the 24 bandsmen were from the Brunswick Salvation Army. They had volunteered as a group. Next. As the months of 1941 for Lark Force at Rabaul went along, food and equipment supply from Australia was a bit mixed in performance. Old stock biscuits arrived in tins that carried labels from the first one. <laughs> in one particular delivery, canned fruit salad was massively oversupplied and the soldiers were then served double helpings of fruit salad three times a day. <laughs> Ammunition ammunition for some weapons arrived as practice type, useless in combat. <laughs> for some other weapons, ammunition never arrived at all. Next. The marching band was popular on the local scene. Concerts were given on a regular basis, and the locals were pleased to attend. Next. The vale is placed in a beautiful bay on the island or New Britain. About 60 miles of open sea separates New Britain from mainland New Guinea. I'll say this just once, the quality of some of the photographs is not brilliant, but better than not having any at all, I suppose. Next. The length of New Britain is something over 300 miles, average width about. 30 miles, and most of it is mountainous jungle. Lark Force was not equipped for any combat or defensive role. There were no anti-aircraft anti guns until August of 1941 when the Neptuna 
of the Burns Philp fleet delivered two of them. They were leftovers from World War I. One of them had a cracked breech. <laughs> that scary problem, plus a severe shortage of ammunition, meant that the gun crew of 54 that arrived with the guns had no opportunity for training and practice. Next. David Selby, S-E-L-B-Y, the solicitor, age 36, was the officer in charge of the gun crew. A nice piece of innovation was thought out. The gun crew, most of them aged less than 19, trained their guns through the old-fashioned arena sights onto the weekly mail plane from Port Moresby. It was gun practice without ammunition. They claimed two successes per week. One for the arrival flight and another for the departure flight. On the days when the mail plane was not available, a small model of an aircraft was carried aloft on a long bamboo pole carried by a runner out there in the distance. And that was the target. And the running job went to anybody from the garrison who had a misdemeanor due for punishment. <laughs> and I did not make that up. <laughs> Prior to the arrival of Black Force, a modest airfield with a grass landing strip 11 miles from Rabaul had been taken over by number 24 squadron uh, RAAF <coughs> as an operating base. Next. The base was called Vanakanal, Vanakanal, under squadron leader John LaRue. Four Hudson bombers stood out in the open. There was just one building <coughs> of sorts at the airfield. It was a galvanised iron roof carried on timber poles, open sided all round. And that was the workshop. The grass landing strip was improved with matting. Grass huts served as living accommodation. Next. A dozen Wirraways took on the role of fighter aircraft. Their formal classification was Advanced Trainer Aircraft. <coughs> Built in Australia under license from America, the Wirraway was required in the circumstances to convert for use as a fighter or as a very light bomber. The RAF at the time had a total complement everywhere of 180 aircraft of different types. There were no fighter aircraft. The very first Australian built Wirraway came off the production line at Fisherman's Bend near Port Melbourne in 1939. 755 were built between then and 1946. There was a second seat for an observer or gunner. At Rabaul, a second airfield called Lacanai was just as basic as Van Akenau, and it served as a backup airfield. The aircraft at Vanakanau were pushed into the tropical growth, lining the airstrip for concealment, and pushed out again when required for action. Next. The local native population assisted, assisted with the muscle work for that. It was said that fighting a speedy Japanese Zero fighter with a Wirraway was a virtual death sentence for the Wirraway pilot. Next. That was soon to be very sadly demonstrated at Rabaul. That's the Zero there. A valuable network of coast watches, some of them civilians, was placed around the Pacific region. They acted as observers 
from isolated places in riding over the Azon with Australia, and that was highly dangerous, isolated work. <coughs> Suddenly, and in dramatic fashion, Lark Force, the garrison force, became a fighting force. Next. The American naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, was attacked by Japanese forces on 8 December 1941, and America and Australia were now at war with Japan. By then, Lark Force had grown from the original 1,000 to 1,400. Six army nurses, six army nurses were now included, and there were also civilian nurses working at two hospitals at the bar. Is this going all right? Yeah. 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 On declaration of war, all Australian women and children on the island were ordered to evacuate to Australia. A few refused to leave. All, all Australian male civilians were required to stay. One suitcase per person was the rule for the evacuees. Next. I think I might have skipped one, Jeff. Uh, that was Hawaii, Pearl Harbor that just left the screen, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. So, next. That's the Neptune. Yep. Yep. It arrived as one of the ships to take the evacuees to Australia on 22 December. Eight weeks after delivering the evacuees from the Baal, the Neptune was sunk at Darwin Harbour in the air raids there. Within weeks of Pearl Harbour, the first Japanese bombs fell upon Rabaul. Some of the Japanese pilots were fresh from their attack on Pearl Harbour. Next. Yes, we're in sequence. But there were high-level bombers and dive bombers. Those on the screen are dive bombers. And I understand there is the second and third smaller bomb tucked under the wings there somewhere. Somebody might know. Okay. We are now into the new year, 1942, January. The first Japanese bombing raid at Rabaul took place on 4 January 1942. In a softening up process of air attacks almost every day, most of the defence facilities at Rabaul, such as they were, were destroyed. The town buildings were avoided by the Japanese bombers and strafing fighters. After an invasion, any buildings would be useful to the conquerors, but damage to the native population was very heavy. The RAF were always hopelessly outclassed by the Zeros, were soon lost in combat. In one air attack, 109 bombers and Zeros were launched from Japanese aircraft carriers out at sea. Eight Wirraways took off to meet them. Six of the Wirraways were shot down. One returned, badly damaged the base. One did not reach the battle. No Japanese aircraft, no Japanese aircraft were destroyed in any of the air battles at Rabaul. Such was the superiority of the Zero fighters. The Wirraway was always regarded as a good aircraft in its own right, but when used as a fighter, it was doing a job that it was not designed for. After several weeks of bombing, Rabaul was really softened up and wide open for invasion 
from the sea. The hospitals were under pressure, dealing with injured soldiers, M, civilians, and native civilians as a result from the air attacks. Clearly, the sea invasion was imminent. Next. From 21 January 1942, six weeks after Pearl Harbor, John LaRue, L-E-R-E-W, John LaRue, at the main airfield received an astonishing order from Port Moresby <coughs> headquarters. The tank, the Japanese fleet, at sea, with all available aircraft in a bombing run. Those weeks of losses in air raids and air battles had left John LaRue with just one aircraft. <laughs> one. Next. It was a damaged Hudson Bay. Was there ever an order given in world military history for a more one-sided contest than that? One bomb versus a fleet of ships of war and the air support that went with that fleet. The word astonishing is not an exaggeration in speaking of that order from on high. The damaged Hudson was made ready to fly by having sheets of corrugated galvanised iron attached to where it mattered. And we can guess that those sheets came from the roof of the workshop. Piloted by squadron leader Jack Sharp and crew, the Hudson took off. Good fortune intervened as fading light <coughs> forced the Hudson back to Rabaul before the fleet could be located. John LaRue then radioed headquarters to suggest that the Hudson be used for the evacuation of as many wounded Australians as possible. The reply came back, no, maintain base in combat ready status. <laughs> Quadrant leader John Drew had the same resources as before with which to maintain base in combat ready status. One battered Hudson bomb. He ignored the ridiculous instruction Instead, he took some motor vehicles to the hospitals and ignoring further orders there, he collected as many patients as he could, as he thought, could be loaded onto the Hudson and returned to the airfield. Plaster casts and bandages became the fashion feature inside the fully loaded Hudson. Morphine helped ease the pain of those who needed it. Jack Sharp took off again, flew 500 miles to Port Moors before refuelling and continued to Australia with his passengers. What a performance. More than 100 RAF personnel were still at the airfield. They were not equipped for any form of land fighting. You need some sort of a weapon for that. And they had nothing. They were loaded onto eight trucks in convoy for evacuation to the mountains. It was the jungle escape for them. The airstrip was damaged by a large force with buried explosives before John LaRue led the road convoy out of the bar. Some Lark Force soldiers were sent on the trucks as escort. After about 15 miles, the RAF convoy had no roads upon which to travel. So the trucks were disabled by the group and the journey continued on foot. We will return to that RAF group struggling out there in the mountains. Any rescue flights from Australia by the Hudson or any other aircraft were not possible because Rabaul was invaded by an overwhelming Japanese force. 
It was early morning, the 23rd January, 1942. I suppose that date is the most significant date in the Rabaul campaign of World War II. And we are now at the crux of the story, and what an epic story it is. In the dark, 5,000 Japanese soldiers approached the shoreline in towed barges and landing craft. Next. It was 5,000 fully equipped Japanese soldiers against 1,400 members of Lark Force with inadequate battle equipment and ammunition. The largest of the Japanese landing craft could carry 90 soldiers or a light tank. Lark Force had Lee Enfield 303 rifles left over from World War I, some machine guns of the same vintage and some mortars that had never been fired in practice through lack of ammunition. There were two coastal guns and the two anti-aircraft guns and a few modern weapons. Next. The soldiers of Lark Force were spread for miles around the bay, waiting in the dark. The Japanese invasion fleet, drawn from a massive main fleet further out the sea, comprised four aircraft carriers, nine destroyers, plus scores of bombers and zero flight fighters. The invasion fleet crept towards the Bay of Rabaul to deliver the landing craft. The night battle, overwhelmingly one-sided, was all over within a few hours. At daylight, the scene was a revelation. The bay seemed to be filled with Japanese ships. Strafing and low-level bombing continued at daylight. The records state that at one stage there were 100 Japanese aircraft in the air unopposed. In the night battle, Light Force had quickly run out of ammunition. When daylight came, the two anti-aircraft guns were not effective against the low-flying aircraft because of their elevated location. And the order came to David Selby, destroy the guns. He did. When the situation was clearly hopeless, the order was given to Lark Force, every man for himself. And that order has been mired in controversy ever since. Each individual had to decide, stay, surrender, and become a prisoner of war, or escape into the jungle-clad mountains. Next. Perhaps as many as half of the total chose the jungle escape. Many civilians did that too. The Zeros performed their strafing runs on escaping vehicles. Japanese foot patrols were soon in pursuit along the jungle tracks. Captured Lark Force soldiers were either executed out there somewhere or taken back to Rabaul as prisoners. After a few days, about 500 members of the Lark Force were still out there in the mountains, broken up into small parties and hoping that, in due course, some point of rescue along the north or south coast could be reached. That was the idea. Find the right place <coughs> and a rescue ship of some sort might turn up. Back in Australia, the news outlets, influenced by government propaganda and starved on material from the bar, printed some bizarre stories. 
listen to this. One description of the night assault had Japanese bodies stacked six feet high along the beaches. Another quote of Japanese deaths at 1500, with Australian casualties limited to 20 wounded. In fact, there were 18, 18 Japanese deaths in the beach assault. We rejoin the Lark Force soldiers out there in the mountains. The escape conditions were horrific. For some of them, that was to continue for as long as three months. Did you get that? As long as three, three months. Okay, then keep telling me if necessary. Thank you. Pounded by Japanese patrols, starved of food, all of them becoming ill with fever of one sort or another. <coughs> Tropical ulcers formed from any scratch. This entry was rough. At least 50 died from malaria along the way. <coughs> some struggled, some struggled along in bare feet, having discarded their boots to avoid leaving tracks for patrols to follow. That right hand might be better, I think. Is that better? Those feet, bare feet scratched and cut, were a haven for leeches. Incessant rain, clouds of mosquitoes, seemingly endless mountain ranges to be climbed. Can the, re, can the natives, can the natives be trusted to not betray their whereabouts? No maps to follow? Where might there be a rescue point? Crocodile infested rivers had to be crossed. A quote from a survivor reads, quote, We had a lot of rivers to cross. They were mostly too deep and too swift the current to swim and were well stocked with crocodiles and sharks. Quite a few of our chaps tried to cross, but they just disappeared. The captured canoe was the best chance." End of quote. Debilitating heat in daytime, mountain cold at night. Snakes, flimsy clothing rotting on their backs. Many of them had entered the jungle with little else but their lightweight khaki uniform or shorts and shirt. If a comrade is too ill and exhausted to continue, do you stay with him or do you walk off to continue this nightmare journey? What a terrible decision to have to make. Now, I should mention that the very jolting item is coming up. At a remote location called Toll Coconut Plantation, T-O-L, Toll Coconut Plantation, 160 captives were baited to death in one of the many Japanese atrocities in the Rabaul campaign. Yes, 160. It will not serve any purpose here today to deliver a graphic description of the event, but it is all on record in its full horror. It occurred 12 days after the night invasion. Next. To place the events in a time context, during those nightmare weeks in the jungle, Darwin, Broome and other nor northern towns were being bombed, Japanese submarines entered Sydney Harbour and Singapore fell. It's a well-known Singapore surrender photograph, that one. At last, in this epic story, comes some good news. More than 350 Lark Force soldiers eventually reached places of rescue. Two of the vessels involved in the sea rescues were the diesel-powered recreational yacht Lorabada, Lorabada, and the almost new 
Burns Phil owned motor schooner Lake Atoy. Next, the Laura Barter listing sideways through overloading, and that's the next real photo. Took about 160, 160 soldiers and civilians, including two women and some children, to Port Moresby. Arriving there after three days' travel on 12 April 1942. David Selby was one of the last force group aboard. Next, David Selby later became a highly distinguished judge and a leading light in Australian law. He reached the age of 96. For the soldiers aboard Bora Barra, their journey following the night invasion had taken 12 weeks. They were picked up on the south coast. We take note that the Law Rabada, with 160 aboard, was designed to carry eight passengers plus a small crew. <laughs> Next, the Lakatoi left from the north coast and arrived after three days at Cairns on March 28, loaded with 214 soldiers and civilians. That was nine weeks after the night invasion. 162 Light Force soldiers were aboard. And one of those soldiers was Chris Renwick's Uncle Bob. The surname G-R-I-E-S. So there's the link to our club and we will come to another link to our club. We have followed the main threads of the story. But it needs to be said here and there, it needs to be said that here and there, were successful escapes by individuals or small groups, saved by vessels of a mixed variety, like fishing craft or private yachts. But all of that is too cloudy to research. Commentaries on the story of large force and number 20 squadron carry strong criticism of the lack of proper support from the Australian government. Lack of equipment overall is repeated. Yet both forces, Army and Air Force, performed magnificently with what they had to work with. The sheer courage of those young Wirraway pilots taking off on their impossible missions is mind-boggling next. We think too of the Light Force soldiers waiting in the dark around the bay with fallen tree logs for shelter, some of them with those ancient 303 rifles. That photo was the first war photo, by the way, trying to show the 303 rifles. And very limited ammunition. We could go on and on about such courage, and we should. A Lark Force officer from Melbourne, with the rank of captain, was a leading participant in terms of intelligent leadership and inspiration in that jungle escape. He was awarded the Military Cross, the highest award in the Mobile Campaign and we will return to him. The RAF convoy, remember the RAF convoy, had success too in their escape. After one month of travel on foot, the group of 100 had grown to more than 150 as civilians and marked for soldiers joined in from here and there. Next. A radio message to Port Moresby was arranged somehow. Two flying boats arrived from Port Moresby. They loaded about two thirds of the total of 150 in the full party. Both aircraft needed a second attempt at takeoff, but arrived safely at Port Moresby. One of the aircraft returned the next day for the others. John LaRue 
was aboard one of those three rescue flights. Those rescue aircraft were known as Empire Flying Boats, owned by Qantas, and they had been used on the Britain to Australia passenger run in peacetime. Next. They were designed in parallel with the short Sunderland flying boat that was built for military use. The word short was not a reference to size. Short was the name of the English company that built them. They had four engines. Next. One of our long-term club members, Les Hall, was a raft pilot on Sunderlands in the island campaign. Les is now resident in a hostel too far away for him to attend our meetings. He was our functions coordinator in the early years. In his working career, he was production manager at the Age newspaper. He was a very keen member of our music group for years and a keen member in the uh, original Friday morning golf group, Liz Hall. <coughs> Next. <coughs> a few days after arriving at Port Moresby, <coughs> as a passenger aboard a rescue flight, John LaRue flew a Catalina from Port Moresby on a bombing raid against the now Japanese held Rabaul. What an amazing turn of events. He was in effect bombing his own airfield, Vanakanau. Catalinas had two engines mounted high, as can be seen there. In a sad side event prior prior to the flying boat rescue, some of the enlarged RAF convoy group had become separated from the main party. They were captured and died in the Toll Plantation Massacre. Now, what happened to those large force soldiers who did not attempt the jungle escape? They were held at Rabaul in huts within a barbed wire compound. They were still at Rabaul five months, five months after the night invasion. And their fate is war, upsetting news on the front. In a sudden move, some officers were kept behind, but the rest were loaded onto a Japanese ship, the Montevideo Maru, along with civilians and nurses Next. More than 1,000 persons were locked below deck. The intended destination was Hainan Island near the Philippines. Eight days into the journey, the ship went down in a torpedo attack by an American submarine, the crew of which had no knowledge that prisoners of war were aboard. A few of the ship's crew and some guards were the only survivors. Next, 16 members of the battalion band went down. The bandmaster, Sergeant Arthur Galich, was a composer of international fame in the brass band network. He had been bandmaster in Brunswick. His compositions are still performed in the brass band repertoire. In his era, he was sometimes compared with the great American band leader, Glenn Miller, as an arranger of band music. Only one regimental band member survived the war. Tenor Horn player Fred Colwood 
he was one of those aboard the Laura Bada. Listing sword, I remember. Next. We mentioned that most of the Bark Force officers from the compound were not taken on the Montevideo Maru. Those and some nurses were shifted to Japan to work in camps there. Some of them survived the war, having endured the typical horrific experiences of prisoners of war under Japanese rule. We check some numbers again. The Lark Force crew grew from 1,000 to 1,400 at Rabat. Of that total, about 360 survived the war. An exact figure is tricky to establish even though some lists of names can be found on the internet. Some military analysts state that in comparative numbers, the Lark Force campaign is the most severe loss in Australian military history in terms of comparative numbers. Just 360 survivors out of 1,400. Yet the story is not well known. The war had ended before the story emerged. Some families waited that long for news. There are some well-written books in the libraries to do with Lark Force. It is from those that much of the material for today's presentation was taken. The drawn-out recovery period in military hospitals, hospitals for many of the survivors can be readily imagined. For example, David Selby spent five months in hospital at Townsville on return from New Britain. Next. There's an early element in the overall islands campaign. Lake Force is honoured at the very beautiful Australian War Cemetery at Rabaul, or near Rabaul. The area is called the Kokopo. Kokopo. The visit there is a moving experience. There are rows and rows of named ground level gravestones and memorial stones across the manicured lawns. There are several acres of tropical, tropical gardens and trees and avenues of vertical panels with names. The cemetery serves as a resting place and memorial for Australian victims of various conflicts in the region down through the years, not just those from the Pacific War. Next. The stepped platform carries a tall column, a tall column as a site for ceremonies. The cemetery was established by the Australian War Graves Commission. Local citizens attend faithfully to the maintenance in an arrangement with the Australian government. Memorial plaques are fixed to the white wall fronting the property. Next. Look at that. You find that go back one step. Memorial plaques are fixed to the white wall fronting the property. One of them honours Light Force. And you find that conversation as you move around the cemetery is made in hushed voice. Such is the feeling of awe and reverence. Next. Cruise ships of good size can tie up at the wharf at the bar. Local tours with a fleet of battered minibuses take visitors about 12 miles to the cemetery and other military landmarks. So the story of large force is perhaps becoming a little better known. Rabaul has a history of volcanic activity. Next. Several times down through the years, the town has been inundated with ash. We see in that photo the volcanoes standing very close to the town. 
As you move along the rough local roads, there are endless piles of grey ash <coughs> pushed aside in the clean-ups following the various eruptions. The ash has gone hard and jungle foliage covers much of it. The convoy of about 12 minibuses is treated like a royal procession as it thumps along on endless potholes. Next, adults and youngsters are out in force, waving and laughing. Tourism is extremely useful for the local economy. The minibus operation is staffed by locals so keen to be pleased with what they have, and what they have is very modest. Those pothole roads are severe on the vehicles, but where will the money come from to repair roads and vehicles in a nation as economically poor as Papua New Guinea? We have been there, haven't we? Last page, come here. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> Those potholes are severe on the passengers too, let me tell you. The roads are really just leftovers from the Japanese occupation of about three and a half years when massive infrastructure was installed in creating a major Japanese military base. Typical of that was the installation of 29 sawmills to supply timber with hundreds of buildings thrown up by the Japanese at high speed. At the peak of the Japanese occupation, the population reached 300,000. As military resources were poured in, prior to the war, the population of the Vale was 7,000 of mixed race. Half a page, Mr. President. We use next. We use this map, like the earlier ones, to remind ourselves that Papua New Guinea today is an independent nation with a population spread across all of the places shown there, this time, in orange colouring. Our Lake Force story has come to an end, but we need to recognise an element of close interest to our club. As mentioned, the Lark Force officer who successfully led his men on that horrific journey of escape was awarded the Military Cross for inspired leadership. He was one of those aboard the Lakatoy. On his return home to Melbourne, the young son was part of a family group that welcomed him back. Next, the son's name was Simon. The father was Captain Ernest Smythe Appel of the Light Force, 2nd 22nd Battalion ALF BX 8370 Military Cross. Yes, Simon's father, and we need to state that Simon did not initiate the telling of this story here today. We ganged up with him. <laughs> Thank you, boy. That was terrific. Kevin, can you come forward and do the honours? Thank you. Well, I think. Uh, oh. Thank you. I, I, obviously, thousands of stories could have been chosen for uh, today uh, as we approach Anzac Day, but I can't think of a more appropriate one. Coda uh, was where the Japanese were defeated on land for the first time and so how quickly things could turn around. But uh, look, it was uh, uh, told with great detail and great uh, empathy, Lloyd, and uh, I, uh, I think you've done a great job. Like, thank you very much. Thank you.